Imagine, if you will, a world in which movie sets have no safety restrictions, where Alec Baldwin has a higher body count than Mary Magdalene, where Viggo Mortensen has far more trivia notes from the set of Lord of the Rings, and where Tom Cruise is basically the same. A world not too far from our own, a future that may have come to pass had one certain tragedy not sealed its fate. You are now entering a dimension of sight and sound. You see a video title up ahead, and you know you are watching one of the worst accidents in film history. The Twilight Zone movie disaster. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Holzkern. <laughs> Holzkern may have started small, but after seven years and over one million customers satisfied, they have become the place to go if you want a watch made from all natural materials with a unique personal touch. Holzkern make watches, and not just any watches. They are a small team based out of Austria that produce the highest quality watches and have been since 2015. Their watches use materials directly from nature with as little processing as possible. I've got a fair amount of respect for nature and I think it's good to get out and actually touch grass as much as possible. Every Holzkern watch is a unique piece due to the grain, marbling and iridescence of the wood, stone and knacker. Another thing that we can thank nature for. While Holzkern watches are made of natural materials, Holzkern understands that you must give back what you take in order to preserve our planet. So everything from production, packaging and delivery are designed to be as sustainable as possible. Also, together with partners such as the Jane Goodall Institute, Holzkern supports reforestation projects and various other projects that have environmental protection or social support in mind. A Holzkern watch is designed to remind you of the nature that it comes from, the connection that you have with it, the uniqueness you share with it, and the importance of how you spend your precious time. It's also great to have something unique and sentimental that lasts. So get a unique Holzkern watch today, either for yourself, family, friends, or that special someone, with a 15% discount on all products using my code COUNT15 at holzkern.com during checkout. Free shipping is provided to both the USA and most EU countries within two to five days and you get a 24 month warranty with a 24 day rate of return. So show them some love, click the link. For all you Zoomers or even Millennials who have never heard of the Twilight Zone, first of all you have touched a little bit too much grass, get back inside and consume some media, but second of all the Twilight Zone was a show that did the whole black mirror thing before it was cool. First airing in 1959, The Twilight Zone was a horror anthology series created and written by Rod Serling, who would also provide the iconic narration. Each episode would have a character placed in a situation that would often seem just a little bit abnormal at first. But before long, the ghouls or gugas would show up, give us the best fright that 60s practical effects could muster, and we would all learn a nice lesson at the end. While the show didn't initially pick up amazing ratings, critics raved about it, with one critic claiming the Twilight Zone is about the only show on the air that I actually look forward to seeing. It's the one series that I will let interfere with other plans. Very soon, the ratings picked up and the show became an iconic piece of television history, with references all over the shop, from Futurama's recurring gag, The Scary Door, parodying the intro to Twilight Zone, to even the term Twilight Zone itself being used hyperbolically to describe spooky or surreal events. 
The original run of The Twilight Zone ended in 1964, but as true back then as it is today, no media is immune to being dragged from its peaceful grave to have an unnecessary remake or sequel being beaten out of its corpse. Better Call Saul was already pushing it a little bit, but apparently there's now another series in discussion. You're, you're ripping the piss, right? Just stop. But a little-known director, you may have heard of him, named Steven Spielberg, decided to produce this particular corpse beating. And soon, production was underway for a Twilight Zone movie with a release in 1983. The movie, like the series before it, was to be an anthology, and while a rarer format to put on the silver screen as opposed to the natural episodic nature of TV, it's not unheard of, and has actually been done quite well if you do it right. See Sin City or The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. The film started with a prologue starring Albert Brooks, who you will know from Drive, and Dan Aykroyd, who you will know from Coneheads and Crystal Skull Vodka. The two characters discussed their favourite episodes of Twilight Zone, then Dan Aykroyd turns into a monster and eats Albert Brooks. Apparently, there is no Dan, only Zool. The film then led into four separate sections, each directed by a different director, and each section being a reimagining of an episode of the classic Twilight Zone series, with some being fairly faithful and others only keeping a few core elements. This video isn't a breakdown of the full movie, so the only section that's really important to us is the first, directed by John Landis. This section stars the late Vic Morrow, whose character Bill Connor has just been passed up for a promotion at work in favour of a Jewish co-worker. His character goes to a bar to try and cool down, he sees his friends, he sits down, and then proceeds to go on a rant that contained more gamer words than the average COD lobby circa 2013. He then harasses two separate waitresses, he talks about the Jews owning everything, he talks about the people of Asian heritage he killed in Korea, now owning his house, despite his house being owned by a Japanese bank, before finally dropping enough end bombs to make a grand wizard blush. It truly was quite a masterful piece of hate speech. The segment then enters the Twilight Zone as Bill exits the bar to find himself in Nazi-occupied France, and the rest of the segment is Bill entering various situations in which the groups of people he was just disparaging are now being killed for their race right in front of him. In Nazi France, he is mistaken for a Jew and shot at, then he is chased until he finds himself in the Deep South, where several KKK members see him as a black guy and try to lynch him, until finally he finds himself in the jungles of Vietnam during the Vietnam War, where American soldiers see him as a VC and shoot at him, until a grenade launches him back into wartime France. He is then loaded onto a freight train with a Star of David patch attached to his jacket and then the train pulls away to what we know as a concentration camp as Bill sees his old friends at the bar that he started the segment in. The standard racist man sees what it's really like type of lesson. However, this is not the entirety of what this section was originally meant to be. Bill is obviously an unsympathetic character. So, a few movie executives who were producing the film decided that John Landis had to make him more sympathetic somehow. Like, at the end of it, he learned his lesson. Landis came up with the idea of having Bill transported back to Vietnam again, where he would then save two Vietnamese orphans from a burning village as the GIs were closing in. And in this scene, he was to escape while being shot at by a helicopter. So, where you have child characters, you need child actors, and the particular child actors chosen for these roles were seven-year-old Micah Din Lei and six-year-old Renee Shinyi Chen. Now, the section required an outdoor nighttime shoot in the Indian Dunes movie ranch at Valencia in California, and normally this wouldn't be an issue, but something problematic for Landis reared its ugly head. Those Pesky child labour laws. In the great state of California, child actors are not allowed to work at night time or in proximity to explosions. But we've all seen Vietnam War movies. 
If you don't have a burning tree line with a full moon illuminating the faces in the trees, you may as well pack up and go home. Luckily for Landis, or unluckily, depending on how you see it, these children were not hired through a child acting agency. Nope, it was that good old-fashioned Hollywood nepotism. There are like five degrees of separation, but a production assistant's husband talked to their friend, who then suggested his niece Renee for the role, and the assistant's husband's friend then called his friend and asked if that guy's son wanted to be in it. Convoluted setup, but basically these kids just got the opportunity through word of mouth and being somehow related to the right people. And since it wasn't employees, but friends helping out, they got around those pesky labour laws. So, due to the unconventional manner of finding these stars of the future, Landis decided he would do a little trolling of California child safety laws and pay the children under the table so he could speed up production and also skip all of the checks and waivers that would normally happen before such a shoot. Landis has also said that he knew if he went through the proper channels, he would never get permission to use actual children in the scene. And they basically cat and moused the children around the set to hide them from the safety and fire officers until they were ready to shoot. So we finally get to the fateful night. July 23rd, 1982, the shooting of the fateful scene. Vic Morrow has the children under his arms and is running across a shallow river. The helicopter, a Bell UH-1B Iroquois, or Iroquois, I don't know, don't know how that's pronounced, don't care to find out, was actually being piloted by a Vietnam War veteran by the name of Dorsey Wingo. It was hovering at about 25 feet from the ground and following Vic and the kids, when suddenly the helicopter plummeted straight into Vic and the child actors. Now, this wasn't a case of the Vietnam pilot saw a burning village, saw Asian children running, and instinct just took over, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. It was actually because when a mortar effect went off a bit too close to the chopper, a piece of shrapnel from the explosion hit the tail rotor. The tail rotor detached, and the helicopter spun out of control, plummeting straight into the actors. Actor Vic Morrow and two small children were killed when the chopper came down as they were shooting a war scene. The helicopter crashed just before 2.30 in the Indian Dunes Park as a Warner Brothers crew is about to wrap up filming for a story in the new Twilight Zone movie. The scene called for a nighttime bombing of a Vietnamese village in which actor Vic Morrow was supposed to pick up two Vietnamese children and run across the Santa Clara Riverbed. Investigators say one of the blasts may have sheared off the helicopter's tail rudder and the huge rotor blade hit Morrow and the kids, killing them instantly. Yes, I cut the footage early. No, I'm not showing the whole thing. It's on YouTube if you want to see it. The three actors were sadly killed instantly. Renee Shin Yi Chen was actually crushed under the right landing skid and Vic Morrow and Micah Din Lei were both decapitated by the main rotor blade of the helicopter. I guess that's why it's called a chopper. Look, I'm sorry. If I don't laugh, I'll cry. All six of the crew on board the helicopter were injured, but none died, thankfully. One of the assistant cameramen on board the helicopter, Randall Robinson, claimed that production manager Dan Allingham told the pilot, that's too much, let's get out of here, in response to the explosions being a little bit too close for comfort. But... Over the radio, John Landis insisted, get lower, lower, get over lower. The accident obviously had a massive fallout in both criminal and civil courts. In the proceedings, the parents testified that they actually had no clue that explosions in helicopters would be anywhere near their children. But by the time they realised this was the case, the shoot was already underway and it was too late to stop it. Another thing to point out is Daniel Lee, Micah's father, was horrified to see the set of a Vietnam village burning since he was actually a survivor of the conflict. Wingo, the pilot of the helicopter, strapped on his biggest pair of balls before he took to the stand for his testimony, stating that Vic Morrow 
had over five seconds between the time the sound of the helicopter changed and that impact. Basically trying to suggest that Vic had plenty of time to get out of the way. The man really took to the stand and thought that the man who was carrying two children through knee-deep water while explosions rattled off all around him was supposed to notice that the helicopter was going to randomly crash. He later said that he didn't mean to place the blame on Morrow, but the comments were out there, and he was very widely mocked and derided, and rightly so. The criminal trial lasted for nine months, with all manner of people being tried for culpability, including Landis and Wingo. But they were both acquitted of manslaughter charges. How? I have no fucking idea. Even though they were found innocent, film regulation organisations introduced tons of sweeping reforms to their safety requirements. The Screen Actors Guild set up a 24-hour hotline for people to call if a scene felt unsafe. Basically, a whistleblower hotline, which also gave them advice on how to approach their rate of refusal. And the Directors Guild of America set up a similar hotline along with regular safety bulletins and harsher crackdowns on directors pursuing unsafe practices. The FAA also decided to define that, yes, you do need a waiver for low-flying helicopters in your films. Which, I mean, yeah, good that you did that now after some children were killed, one was actually fucking decapitated, but it probably would have been a good idea to slap some sort of restrictions on airborne deadly Beyblades a while ago. In 1996, John Landis stated there was absolutely no good aspect about this story. The tragedy, which I think about every day, had an enormous impact on my career from which I may possibly never recover. The man really pulled a Tiger King. <laughs> He actually had the cheek to pull a Tiger King. Maybe, maybe your concerns should have been directed towards the three people, two of them children, who were killed on your set. You know, maybe towards their families too. Maybe, you know, just a suggestion. All in all, a fairly short but fairly tragic tale. Very similar to many episodes of the classic Twilight Zone, where we find a moral or a lesson through tragedy and circumstance. In John Landis's segment of the movie, the moral was to not spread hatred towards a group of people until you've walked a mile in their shoes, during a time when those shoes were usually swinging from a low-hanging branch. But the moral that we do learn from the production of this segment was this. Don't blow up a helicopter that has children under it. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody says, subscribe!